Greetings in the name of Christ and welcome to the service of St. Andrew's on this second Sunday in Lent. We're so glad you have joined us. We seem to be drawing people from all over the country and maybe beyond. I don't know. How great is that? So welcome. Uh, you're welcome to join our coffee hour each week, which is at 1145. We send out a link to that if you'd like to be a part of that. Uh, let us know through the church office. Uh, and membership ministry team is continuing to make our listening campaign calls. The primary reason for these calls is to build our relationships with each other. And you also might get questions like, you know, what has changed since you came up here or moved up here or grew up here? Uh, what do you see your family and friends challenged with? And um, we hope that you will chime in, and if you don't get one of those calls, if you'd like to, let us know too. Lenten classes, speaking Christian is one class, and the Lord's Prayer is the other. You are welcome to join those classes at any point too. I think uh, in a way they're standalone. This week, my class will be doing chapters 5 and 6, and um, Russ Brandt can tell you which ones they are doing. So you're welcome to join at any point there. My class begins at 1 on Wednesdays and Russ is at 1030 on Thursdays. We also are offering an evening prayer service through the season of Lent uh, made available by our wonderful um, director of music ministry here, Michael Beery. And we are sending out links to that too. It's just a beautiful way to center yourself during these Lenten weeks. We've been participating in the bacon food drive this week. If you did not get your food in, you still can bring that by this week at some point. We'll make sure it gets to bacon or go to the bacon website and donate. There's a big donate button there and you can make a difference in people's lives with food. And they are looking for lunch foods like macaroni and cheese and tuna and peanut butter and things like that. Uh, communion. Next week uh, will be part of our worship service, the first Sunday of the month, so we invite you to gather your elements um, for that service ahead of the time that it begins. Each week during the pandemic, we have been passing a virtual piece. You're invited to reach out to two or three people, pass the peace of Christ to them, either in an email or a phone call or even with FaceTime, possibly. So the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please join me in the call to worship by reading responsively. Hear the promise of the Lord our God. I will bless you and make you a blessing. Hear the calling of the Lord Jesus Christ Take up your cross and follow me. Let us pray. God of wonder, when we catch sight of your vision, sometimes our belief wavers. When we hear the absurdity of your unbreakable covenant with us, like Sarah and Abraham, we laugh. When we face the wisdom of the looming cross, like Peter, we want an alternative. Forgive us. Meet us in our humanity, loving God, and move us gently into the deeper waters of faith. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Letting go of certainty. We want control and certainty in our life. We want to know that we are on the right path, that we have the right answers, and that we worship the right God. We want to trust our own certainty. And Lent is an invitation to acknowledge our illusions of certainty and to open up God's wonder-filled grace, mercy, and love. As we extinguish this light, we let go of our certainty for the need for answers, for faith without doubt, and for the desire to be self-reliant.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we like to pretend that we have life figured out, that we don't need you, and that we can possess ultimate knowledge. Open our hearts to your gift of grace that enables us in faith to trust you. Amen. We have entered the 40-day Lenten journey with penitence in our hearts. The polarization, enmity, and fissures that have scarred our country and world are in us as well. We yearn for truth, peace, and justice. Yet we know that we have not lived as those who are formed in the truth, peace, and justice of Jesus Christ. We confess our sin assured of God's mercy and empowering grace, let us pray. God, our refuge and fortress, forgive us when we fail to trust in you. Sometimes we fall to temptation. Other times we are swayed by false words and speak false words of our own. 
We might choose our ease and comfort over your demanding claims on us and this world. Yet in turning from you, we settle for less than the abundant generosity you intend. Forgive us, we pray. Do not let us be put to shame, O God. Hear us as we call to you and show us your salvation. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. God in Christ is steadfast in love and mercy. So friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In Christ we are forgiven and set free from the sins that bind and enslave us. We are empowered to love God with all of who we are and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Thanks be to God. Amen. Holy Spirit, open our hearts to receive your word. Reveal to us the good news and enable us to trust in the loving promise of your grace and salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in our first reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make a covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come to you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she will give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today's second reading comes to us from the book of Romans, chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void, for the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said 
so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel reading this morning is from the 8th chapter of Mark. I'll be reading verses 31 through 38. I invite you to listen for the word of God. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel 
will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory, in the glory of his Father, with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Peter was a dedicated disciple. For nearly three years, he had seated himself at the feet of Rabbi Jesus and had learned carefully and listened intently. He had witnessed the miracles of the Lord's healings and the evil spirits being sent out from the possessed. So it was no surprise when Jesus asked, Who do people say that I am? that Peter responded with, You are the Messiah. But just as quickly, Peter stumbled. And he might have stumbled because he was trying to protect his beloved rabbi, but he stumbled nonetheless. And Jesus had to respond, Peter, get out of my way. Satan, get lost. You have no idea how God works. Setting his mind on human things rather than on divine things, Peter had yet to learn one of Jesus' most important lessons, that God's realm might demand sacrifice and suffering. When we utter the familiar words, Thy kingdom come, we are aligning ourselves with how God works and the sacrifice that might be demanded of us. Since Ash Wednesday, we have been thinking about prayer, and in the specific, the Lord's Prayer. And in that regard this morning, I would like to share with you two new thoughts. First, whenever you pray, thy kingdom come, remember that you are proclaiming a primary message of the gospel. The kingdom of God is near. And second, that in these very words, God is encouraging you to examine your own life as follower and disciple. Let me begin by stating that the disciple Peter was not the only one who had a distorted view of discipleship as God wants it. We live in a world where men and women have been led to believe that faith is a private matter and that God's holy and everlasting reign is a personal, embrace, a personal reward for embracing a private faith. Perhaps you accept this as well. But friends in Christ, let me tell you, such a personal private faith has little to do with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the reign of God that Jesus came to proclaim. This week in our class on the Lord's Prayer, we looked at a number of parables in Matthew 13 in which Jesus describes God's realm. Here are a few of them as rendered in the message. God's kingdom is like an acorn that a farmer plants. It is quite small as seeds go, but in the course of years, it grows into a huge oak tree and eagles build their nests in it. God's kingdom is like yeast that a woman works into the dough to make dozens of barley loaves and waits while that dough rises. Are you listening to this, Jesus says? Really listening? God's kingdom is like a treasure hidden in a field for years, and then accidentally found by a trespasser. The finder is ecstatic. What a find! And proceeds to sell everything he owns in order to buy the field. 
Or God's kingdom is like a jewel merchant on the hunt for exquisite pearls. Finding one that is flawless, he immediately sells everything and buys it. Jesus teaches that God's realm is worth it all and worth every sacrifice. When we pray thy kingdom come, it is not a geographical place such as one of nations and peoples. No, it's much more subtle than that. Yes, the reign of God comes secretly, silently, and is unstoppable. Yet with this petition, we pray that we may be part of the realm of God, part of opening the way for it, of joining in with it. God's reign doesn't depend upon us, yet God wants us to be part of it. Now, before you become overly concerned about this role in the kingdom, let me remind you that the invitation to live a life as a disciple of Jesus Christ is a privilege and an honor. God has drawn us into God's wonderful story of salvation so that one day we will draw to, it will draw to a close with our being ushered into the church triumphant. It is the promise of a realm more glorious than anything we have known or can imagine. Jesus himself reminds us, for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and to lose their life? Such an invitation is worth the call and the challenge of living a declared and public faith. As Jesus called the crowds to him, together with his disciples, he encouraged them to examine their lives. These teachings are at the very heart of the Christian faith and Jesus' invitation to discipleship. First, if anyone wishes to come after, if anyone wishes to be my follower, let them deny themselves. Ordinarily, we understand the words to deny as giving up something we prize or cherish. During the season of Lent, we know people who might choose to deny themselves a pleasure, to remind themselves of Jesus' sacrifice. Pleasures like alcohol or chocolate or caffeine. In another form, when people occasionally fast, they were reminded of those for whom hunger is not a choice, but a daily companion. As important as this di dimension of self-denial might be, this is only a small portion of what Jesus meant by self-denial. To deny yourself is also to affirm publicly that your own personal identity is intimately linked with Jesus Christ. To deny yourself cannot simply be a private, personal matter, because in the test of denial, we are asked to share publicly with others the very best that we have to offer. Not necessarily in grand gestures, even in the smallest witness of faith. When we do that in public, it can be noticed. It takes courage to witness, like to bow at the table in a restaurant, to say a silent prayer. Or it takes confidence to write a letter to the editor of the local newspaper or the area newspaper to make a claim for something that you believe as a Christian. It takes self-assurance to abandon the way of the crowd and to embrace a lifestyle that supports the spiritual health of your family or to stand up for someone being belittled by others. To deny yourself is to be conscious of your identity in Jesus Christ. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, Peter denied his relationship with Jesus. When questioned if he knew Jesus, Peter said outright, I do not know him. No doubt the word or words, get behind me, Satan, might have hauntingly come to the mind of Peter as he realized what he did. 
Likewise, when we pray thy kingdom come, we are asking ourselves in what ways we are denying ourselves and giving public witness to our identity in Jesus Christ. Secondly, our Lord Jesus teaches us that if you are to live a public faith, you must learn to take up your cross. To take up our cross is to recognize the cost of discipleship. It is to act boldly in spite of the consequences. More importantly, to take up your cross is to proclaim that not even hardship and burden can tear your loyalty away from God. Emmanuel Ocho grew up in Dallas attended the very fine private school St. Mark's with his three siblings. He's the son of Nigerian immigrant parents. And in 2012, he was drafted into the NFL by the Cleveland Browns and later played for the Philadelphia Eagles. He did all that while earning a master's degree in sports psychology at the University of Texas in the off season. In 2016, he left the NFL for ESPN, where he served as the youngest national football analyst and was named a 2018 Forbes Under 30 selection. He is now a Fox, a Fox Sports analyst. But perhaps more than these other excellent accomplishments, Acho is the creator of the video that went viral and is now a video series called Uncomfortable uncomfortable conversations with a black man. He's now written a book on the series, and I think it would be a great one for us to read as a congregation of mostly white people. Emmanuel Acho is a genuine and generous person. In listening to the podcast Unlocking Us with Brene Brown, Acho recalled going to make his first video, which he had no idea would do what it did. Since he's a person of faith, I can tell you that he felt called to do it. In fact, the day he was to go in to record, the person with which he was to do the recording called about an hour before and said that she just could not do it. Their question and answer format, she just was not able to step up the plate to do. She was apologetic, but she just couldn't do it. So Acho was faith faced with whether or not to continue. He was fearful, and just as he was walking into the studio, he received a text from a black friend who said, don't do this. So in the course of this, he's gotten criticism from all sides, and you can imagine what some of that criticism might be. He goes into the studio in spite of it, records a video made up of questions white people might ask of a black person, the kinds of questions those of us who are white are afraid to ask because we might look bad or look like we're out of our league, which most of us are in this regard. He records the video last summer, and since then, over 2.2 million people have viewed it. I submit to you that Emmanuel Acho knows what it is to take up one's cross. He said to Brene Brown that he had to do it. He felt compelled, compelled to do it. He couldn't not do it. To be sure, not all we feel compelled to do falls into this category. If you felt compelled to storm the Capitol, you might be paying a price for it now. But Emmanuel Acho's mission is to build a bridge and to bring people together, to help people understand what the experience of being a person of color is like in our culture. We can be sure, in terms of Jesus' disciples, that they knew the dangerous, cruel nature of the cross. In the disciples' younger years, when they were youngsters, Judas the Galilean had led a rebellion against Rome. Judas and his army had broken into the Roman armory in the village of Sepphoris, which was about four miles from where Jesus grew up in Nazareth. The Roman vengeance was swift. The village was burned to the ground, 
Its inhabitants were sold into slavery, and 2,000 of the rebe rebels were crucified on crosses that were lined up along the roadside. The cross was a dreadful warning to others who might be tempted to rebel against the Roman army. Like Emmanuel Acho, like the disciples, when we pray thy kingdom come, we too have to ask ourselves how the cross and the cost of discipleship is being made known in our lives. Finally, our Lord teaches us that if we are to live a faithful life, we must learn to follow him. As we pick up our crosses in Jesus' name, through whatever comes our way, we discover our God who loves us and forgives us and calls us friends because that is God's nature. In the journey of being Christ's disciples, we learn to recognize him and to follow and trust him as Savior. Although Peter is remembered as the disciple who is rebuked by Jesus, it was upon the faith of this foolish and of this same foolish and forgiven disciple that the realm of God would come and that Jesus would build his church. And it is upon this same imperfect faith and witness that God continues to use us. Peter never again forgot and denied Jesus. In fact, when he was martyred and uh, was about to be crucified, he refused to be crucified as his master. He was hung upside down on a cross in order to not be in the same position as Jesus. For better or worse, as Christians, you and I must live publicly in the world. Our faith and follies are visible for all to see. But be assured, God's kingdom is and will come. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, you dare ask that your faith in God be made visible for all to see and that those who see may trust that God's good and wondrous kingdom is being made manifest even through us. To God be the glory. Amen.
now let us affirm our faith using um, a portion of the first catechism. Jesus called disciples to follow him. He fed the hungry, healed the sick, blessed children, befriended outcasts, required people to repent, and forgave their sins. He taught people not to fear, but to trust always in God. He preached the good news of God's love and gave everyone hope for new life. And as a result of his life and death and resurrection, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are the church. We are people who believe the good news about Jesus, who are baptized and who share in the Lord's Supper. Through these means of grace, the Spirit renews us so that we may serve God in love. Amen. As disciples of Jesus Christ, it is also our great privilege to turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, our creator and redeemer, we pray that the spirit of Jesus would be with us as we continue our journey through Lent. Jesus called his disciples to pick up their cross and follow him. Help us to discern what that means for us as the church in this time and place. Give us the courage to name suffering and evil and to stand in resistance to it. Give us endurance when we face persecution for resisting abuses in our lives and communities. Empower us to stand with those who suffer on account of homelessness, lack of food or resources, or other injustices. Inspire us to see Christ in the least of these in our midst. O oh God, we pray for those who are isolated and lonely during this pandemic. May we find ways to be a comfort for them. We pray for children and parents who are navigating school and work under stressful circumstances. We pray for those who have lost loved ones because of the virus and are grieving the loss. We pray for your church in this time of crisis and that we would find ways to live your mission. We also pray for those hurt by the snow and ice storms that have ravaged large sections of our country, adding to the already stressful realities of life in the current crisis. Oh God, we continue to pray for the global community as it grapples with this pandemic. We pray that you would give us the fortitude to take responsibility for measures that will protect us all. We pray especially for those hit hardest by the strains of this menace and pray for those in leadership in our communities, states, and nations as they negotiate ways in which to aid those most afflicted. We pray for a speedy process of vaccination in this country and in countries around the globe. And we pray for fairness in access to the vaccine for countries that heretofore have not received it. In all of this, great God, help us be part of the solution. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
God is a fountain of good gifts that have been bestowed upon all of us. Let us respond to these gifts by returning a portion of our resources as a sign that all of whom we are is a gift from God. Last week, as I watched children and families sled down the hill outside my office window, they were having such fun, there was so much joy, that that is my hope, that we will be part of ushering in that kind of joy and energy and laughter in the communities, in our families, and in the world around us. Thank you for your generosity and your faithfulness in making such joy take place. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the covenant you established with Abraham and Sarah, which you have opened to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Accept these offerings with the dedication of our lives that we may be for the world a sign of your abiding love and a testament to your enduring promise. In Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours. Almighty God, now and forever. Amen.
as you follow Jesus, may God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be and abide with you, and may the Trinity uphold you on your way. Amen. Thank you.